Hi, I'm Commissioner Rob Gelder, and welcome to this episode of Commissioner's Corners. Do you ever wonder what happens to all that rainwater that falls from the sky? Well, today we're talking about stormwater, so stay tuned and you will learn a lot. Well, welcome back. We are at Whispering Furs Stormwater Park here in Silverdale, and joining me now is Michelle Perdue, who is the program manager for our stormwater division at Kitsap County. Michelle, thanks so much for being part of the program today. Thanks for inviting me. So, you know, we're talking about stormwater. We in the Northwest, especially in the Western side of Washington State, get a fair amount of rain <laughs> and, um, it comes down and I think it's pretty interesting as to what happens to it. What is stormwater? Because I mean, it may be a term that not everybody is familiar with, right? And why should we care? Absolutely. Sounds like kind of an existential question, doesn't it? <laughs> what is stormwater? Well, we like to think of stormwater as the rain that comes down that runs off of our developed landscape. And, and the reason why that's a problem is because when it runs off our, our streets and our parking lots and our roofs and all of those surfaces that we call um, impervious surfaces, which means the rain can't percolate down through them anymore. When it runs off, it, it moves downstream and it picks up pollutants along the way. So it picks up things like oils and metals from the street, it picks up fertilizers from your yard, it picks up pet waste on its way. And as you know, I mean, here in Kitsap, we're blessed because we are, we are flanked by two major precious water bodies. We've got Hood Canal and Puget Sound, and we've got scores of our beautiful, precious streams and, and runoff with all the associated pollutants often makes its way downstream to those. So, with our stormwater program, um, our reason for living is basically to make sure that that runoff that makes it downstream is as clean as we can make it. Just to share with our viewers of the program, I mean, this is basically a requirement of local government to, to take care of stormwater, is it not? Absolutely. So Kitsap has what they call a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NPDES permit through the Department of Ecology. That's an offshoot of the Clean Water Act. So that regulates our stormwater and the pollutants that you know we, we are trying to prevent from going downstream. But it's more than that. Our stormwater program also has three major goals. So that's to reduce pollutants like we talked about, but it's also to reduce flooding and also to protect fish habitat. So, you know, it's not just for us a permit requirement or, or something that we're regulated to do, it's, it's the right thing to do to protect our precious resources. So when we plan for especially um, a new stormwater facility, mm -hmm. Um, what, are, what are the goals when that is being designed and, and planned for? We're looking, at, we're looking at treating the stormwater that it picks up. We're looking at, like I said earlier, reducing local flooding by you know, managing all of that capacity that comes in. But we're also talking about in the long run, creating capacity for more development. So, you know, it's kind of a threefold process there. And I understand at times, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a goal also based on that permit and the requirement is to try to achieve a certain amount of, of treatment of that stormwater that predates or the development of the area, sort of kind of bringing it back to that prior state when it was all forested. Absolutely. So if you can imagine, and, and this is the perfect location to do it in, okay, because you can look around you. Um, we're standing in the Clear Creek watershed right now. Think about what this place looked like a couple of hundred years ago, you know, before people really settled here and developed. What you would see is you would see a lot of forest. Um, so we have trees, we have understory, we have native plants, we would have the duff, you know, that's, that underlies the trees. And all of that 
picks up that rainwater and intercepts it before it gets down to the ground and runs off and it, it lets the earth act as a sponge. So what we're really doing with our program is trying to emulate those natural processes as best we can. So I think most people are probably familiar with um, the pond concept. Um, yep. As they're driving around the community, they see the, the little depression of the pond behind uh, maybe a split rail fence, maybe it's chain link. But is that sort of the, the go-to method anymore? <laughs> Not anymore. So, you know, a really great example of that is this Whispering First Stormwater Park. So what we're looking at as a goal these days, rather than just, you know, install those, those rainwater jails, as, as some so eloquently put it, you know, we are looking at creating facilities that are multi-use, right? So with a facility like this, we're getting treatment and detention with the facilities here, but we're also getting a location where people can come in and, and enjoy themselves. We're adding community amenities. So this is the second in our, in our stormwater parks that we've installed in Kitsap. We've got another one down at the Manchester Stormwater Park that operates in a, a little bit of the same way, where it's given us space not just for treatment, but also for people to come in and be able to use that place in, you know, in ways that maybe are valuable too for human health. So as opposed to just fencing it off and saying, here, we're doing something here, but just stay out. Absolutely. Inviting people in, giving them an opportunity to learn about the processes that are happening in the whys. Absolutely, it's right here in front of you. And we've got, you know, we've got signage everywhere. Our education and outreach program does tours to try to bring people in and to connect them to the resources because when you understand you know the processes of why you're doing things I mean it also connects to actions that folks can do at home so this project ties in you know in a big way to this watershed wide approach that we've been taking so what does that mean so if you look at Clear Creek here, we didn't just put in this park. We've got this stormwater park, and we're, we've worked from the large scale all the way down to the small scale. You've got Whispering Firs, we've got the Clear Creek uh, floodplain restoration downstream, and if you look all the way downstream at Dyes Inlet, you've even got the Buckland Hill bridge replacement. Okay, so those, I would say, are our larger scale projects. Mm -hmm. But then we're also doing things that, that you don't see quite so visibly. So we've had a couple of culvert replacement projects also here in the Clear Creek watershed. And what those have done is they've opened the, the stream up basically for fish passage. So that's kind of the mid scale, but we're also working, what you don't see is we're also working with folks to do it on the human scale. Um, encouraging people to put in rain gardens at home. We're putting in mutt mitt stations in neighborhoods. So we're encouraging people to pick up pet waste. It's not just the large actions, it's all the way down to the very small ones that you can do at home. And they're all, from that standpoint, they're really kind of integrated and part of a system. You illustrated the Clear Creek example, but they don't function in isolation. They all function together to achieve the ultimate goal. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. So is there anything else? You mentioned uh, outreach and education and um, trying to invite people in and give tours, etc. Are there other components to outreach and education that is happening actively in the community? I know that we've had a couple of uh, opportunities to actually uh, do some paintings around some stormwater grades. That's, that's pretty exciting too. So we do projects like that, and what you're referring to is our storm drain art project. Um, we did our pilot, not last year, but the year before in Keyport, and we just completed one in Manchester this year. We'll have another one upcoming this year in another location. But the goal there is to um, draw attention, basically, from a storm drain and make that visual connection for people that that storm drain connects to a resource. Mm -hmm. So the art that's installed around those storm drains, you know, is all educational. And it was also a really good way for us to connect with our local artists and our local communities. 
And I would imagine that it's, you don't just install these facilities and then kind of walk away, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It, there's probably got to be a lot of, of maintenance that goes into it. Um, and even looking at sort of the, the infrastructure that was in place a couple decades ago probably needs to be dealt with as well. So um, is that something that happens a lot? There are 33 staff in the stormwater division and we have professionals on staff that span a broad spectrum of expertises. So we, we're not only doing these large projects that you can see very visibly, but we're also out there doing operations and maintenance. We have a large group that goes out and cleans facilities and makes sure that they're in good working order. We have a retrofit group that's um, looking at our assets and, and managing those assets so that they are replaced before fa they fail. So they're all connected. Um, one of the exciting pieces about that is they're also connected to our new C-Click Fix app, which means if you see a problem, you know, with a, with a storm drain or you have local flooding or you see a spill, you can report it through there and it immediately goes through to our staff that goes out and responds. Great. Well, thank you so much for being part of the program today. I appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned and you're going to continue learning a lot. Welcome back. We are still in Silverdale, but now at a different stormwater facility. And joining me is Michelle Philly, who is our retrofit program supervisor. Michelle, thanks so much for being part of the program today. Thank you. So retrofit, I mean, I think most people might think of that term when it comes to like remodeling a home or kind of putting something new in. But it is apropos, I mean, retrofitting the way I interpret it, it means that we're kind of trying to bring something old to up to current standards. So how do we actually do that with stormwater facilities in an already built environment? Um, so the way we figure out what our projects are for the year is going to be through inspections. So we have a pretty robust inspection program. Uh, we also do monitoring and we have studies performed that help us examine certain parts of the county that may need uh, more attention than others. And then we also get uh, information from the public. And one of those programs is the C Click Fix uh, program that is uh, available on the web or an app on your phone. Great. So when it comes to um, most people, I think, think of stormwater facilities as a pond behind a fence. Um, but that's changed a lot in terms of the, the technology. And so really, what are you doing to some of those old ponds to make them function better now? Well, it really depends. Um, it, it depends on how much flow it's getting and where it's at. But some of the things we do is we add more uh, native vegetation to them, or we may expand it to take more water, or we may uh, configure the internal workings of it so it performs better and up to current standards. Okay. And who, what organization or who drives what the current standards are? Uh, we have federal, state, and local guidelines, and our local guidelines are the ones we look at first, and then we go to the state level beyond that. So if the standards that are applied sort of help us design the retrofit program or the, the pond or this infrastructure to make sure that we achieve certain goals or outcomes, whether it's flow or water quality, is that correct? So yeah, so if we're looking at a project for retrofit, we need to figure out why is this on the list? Is there a problem here? So it would be, if, you know, if there's flooding, if we get a public uh, request come in, or you know the inspection crews find that it's not functioning properly um, so then we kind of go from there and then work on a design and that's kind of what i supervise as a design group and then what we produce goes to the crews and they build it so so you're you then we actually have that capacity in-house within the mm -hmm. county in the stormwater division to design the retrofits and then work with our crews to actually implement them yep Yes, I'm a civil engineer and I have another engineer who works under me and we 
uh, get the information. We have survey go out. We work on the scope of the project. We work very closely with our O&M crews to determine what is feasible. And then we produce plans and go from there. That's awesome. So sometimes I know this is a, actually a fairly large facility um, that we're at right now. Do you end up having to sometimes and to create and achieve the retrofit? Do you end up having to acquire property or or try to expand a, a, to have, have a bigger footprint? Sometimes uh, we usually, I mean, acquiring properties usually uh, goes into the capital projects program because those are a lot bigger. Our projects tend to be a lot smaller and we usually stay within the footprint that the existing facility is, but it's not unheard of for us to have to go purchase right away or additional property. Great. So is there anything that you want to make sure that our viewers know about that I haven't asked you? Um, I guess that the retrofit program is the silent workhorse uh, because we do a ton of work, but nobody ever knows about it. <laughs> it's one of those out of sight, out of mind type of things. Yep, and I work with really great people who work really hard, and it's a pretty awesome job. Well, wonderful, and I appreciate that, and it's definitely one of the things as our environment continues to change around us uh, that we need to know that we have to accommodate the, the growth and, and the constantly changing knowledge base that we have to make sure that we're doing it better. So thank you for everything that you do and for being part of the program today. Thank you. And I think I have to chat with somebody about some operations and maintenance, so stay tuned. Welcome back and joining me now is Steve Downing who is the Operations and Maintenance Supervisor for the Stormwater Division. Steve, thanks so much for being part of the program. You bet. So when we talk about stormwater, just how big of a stormwater system do we have in the county? Uh, we have about 600 stormwater ponds. We have uh, about 130 low impact development slash green stormwater solution sites. Uh, we cover from basically the Pierce County line down to the south, clear up to Foulweather Bluff, uh, to the north, uh, sections in East Bramerton, Port Orchard, Manchester, Paulsboro, uh, everything in unincorporated Kitsap County. So what's a typical day? Or what do you usually have to deal with when you're kind of maintaining the system or the infrastructure? A lot of MPDS required maintenance that we do. Uh, We'll go out uh, certain times a year, uh, clean all the storm inlets out. We're trying to remove sediment, uh, other pollutants from the storm basins. We have uh, green stormwater solutions where we have these naturalized settings like this, these naturalized stormwater ponds. Uh, there's routine maintenance on these. We're going around looking for invasive species, uh, trimming brush back, picking up trash. Uh, we have a construction group that will, uh, when we identify problems, uh, when it comes to flooding, uh, we can send these guys out and uh, pretty much fix you know, any issues that come up on the stormwater side. Uh, part of that's driven to by uh, working with other departments, working with the road shop, looking at what kind of uh, overlays that they have coming up in the future. We try to get out ahead of that, do an inspection of our infrastructure. Does it need to be replaced? Uh, do repairs need to be made and then uh, just make a list from that and then kind of knock that out as, as the, the you know, season progresses and try to get it finished up before they start their, their paving in the spring. So is there a kind of a preventative maintenance type of schedule or a system that you apply to the, the maintenance overall? Um, yeah, I mean, we're trying to be proactive, uh, going out, doing inspections, trying to identify any problems that, that we might have out there, taking care of, you know, citizen complaints that, that come in. Uh, with the storms that we've recently had, it's tested the system that we have, and uh, we have found some faults, and from those faults, we'll, we'll identify those issues and, and see what we can do about, you know, reducing local flooding and, um, you know, taking care of uh, places that, that need to be fixed, uh, you know, failures in, in piping and uh, catch basins and, and other parts of the infrastructure. So this is a kind of happening all year round or do you have a big push to make sure 
certain things are done before the rainy season hits? There's a, yeah, I mean, from uh, March to uh, really into October mm -hmm. is heavy construction season. We try to supplement some of our personnel with seasonal help. So during that dry weather, we can get a lot of these things done while it is dry and, and kind of in that dry window. So can you tell us about how many different uh, complaints or issues do you have to respond to at any given year? Oh gosh, it really is uh, weather dependent. Uh, the more uh, rainfall that we get in a short period of time, it seems like we get more calls. Uh, we can get, you know, 30 a day in uh, heavy rainfall periods. Wow. Uh, and then uh, really only a uh, half dozen probably on a daily basis. And a lot of those are just information. People are curious about what they have, you know, infrastructure in their neighborhood or infrastructure, you know, out in the street or in front of their house. And we're able to answer those questions and quickly, you know, close out any kind of concerns that they have. Uh, you know, oftentimes they want to know about, you know, specialized equipment and stuff that we have. You know, one of those is the truck here that we have. and. This is, uh, you know, one of the most expensive and sophisticated pieces that we have, but it's a necessary piece of equipment, and it's extremely versatile with, uh, you know, everything that it can do from, you know, uh, sucking out catch basins to flushing out pipes. Um, it has a big debris tank. We operate a, a decant facility where we're able to uh, take those pollutants. Uh, it's dewatered. All that water actually gets treated through the treatment plant that we have. Mm -hmm. And then all the solids, uh, once they're dried out, they get hauled over to Olympic View Transfer Station and taken to a uh, landfill. Wow, that's amazing. Now, so you're balancing then the, the complaints or the concerns that come in with your other work schedule. And is the majority of those, that contact from the public coming through the C Click Fix app nowadays? or? The majority of it does come through the C-Click Fix app, and uh, you know we're able to respond quickly, quickly to that. Our crews all carry tablets; uh, they can identify, you know, if a request comes up, if they're in that area, if it's something that they can take care of. It's usually taken care of within a 24-hour period when it comes to our crews, so they're they're really quick to respond with, you know, the technology and the programming and the C-Click Fix app. We're able to reach out and and take care of, you know, most you know, customer concerns that we have. Great. So is there something I didn't ask that you want to make sure the viewers of the program today know about? Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize all the hard work that, that the crews do out there. A lot of the stuff that that they're doing and working on isn't above ground, it's actually below ground when they're taking care of those pipes and they're taking care of those catch basins and targeting certain pollutants. and. It, uh, it's important, I think, to, to recognize the hard work and even through um, everything that's, that's gone on, these guys have showed up every day, they're, they're doing a fantastic job and, and, you know, hats off to them. They, they, they really do a great job and, and a benefit to the public. I agree and thank you for, uh, on behalf of the crew and, and thank you for all that you're doing for being part of the program today. I heard about some salmon that have hatched that are in a tank that I need to go check out. So thanks for being part of the program. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Joining me now is Pat Kirschbaum, who's the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Stormwater. So Pat, I was told that I needed to talk to you to understand what is Salmon in the Classroom. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Rob. So uh, Salmon in the Classroom is a program that was started by the Central Kitsap Kiwanis Club back in 1988, 89 timeframe. Um, the club supported it until about 2009, and then the county and the Clear Creek Task Force partnered to continue the program. Um, with support from the Suquamish Tribe, where the eggs come from. Um, AMS, uh, Air Management Solutions, is a local company that provides maintenance on the tanks. And then we have a lot of partners that help with our field trips, Kitsap PUD, the Kitsap Public Health District, um, the WSU Extension volunteers, and community volunteers. And basically what happens is eggs come to the classrooms in January, early January, and the students learn about the salmon life cycle, ha salmon habitat needs, 
uh, human impact on salmon. Mm -hmm. And they're learning all of that while they're raising salmon from egg to olivin to fry. And it usually takes until about mid to late March. And then they attend a field trip at Clear Creek and Silverdale where they release their salmon. They learn about water quality. They learn about the stream bugs that live in the stream. And then they also learn about the habitat. So what is, can you expound a little bit more about, so what is that nexus between salmon and stormwater? Why, why is this an important connection? So think about when it rains, the water falls on the land, and, and there's a lot of hard surfaces that we've created as we've built things. Mm -hmm. So rather than the water soaking into the ground, it runs off the ground, it picks up a lot of pollutants as it's going, and then it goes through storm drains and ditches and pipes and different facilities that we have and eventually makes its way out to creeks. And so some of those, that pollution can be carried down with that rainwater and that stormwater runoff. Um, but also we could have so much rain coming down at once that that flow is a really heavy flow in our streams and that can impact the habitat, it can cause erosion. And that erosion creates silt in the streams, small particles of dirt that can then kind of settle between the spaces or in the spaces that are between the rocks at the bottom of the stream where salmon eggs and salmon olivin are living. Mm, okay. um, so if they're there at that time of the, the year, then that can impact them. Uh, also, even in the summertime as that's happening, um, once the salmon come back to spawn, it makes it harder for them to dig their reds in the, in the uh, gravel of the, uh, excuse me, to dig their reds in the gravel of the stream. Okay. So I know, so you've got salmon in the classroom, but there's also, I've had the pleasure of attending the water festival as well. And that's a big part of the education and outreach and trying to let youth know about that, that cycle and all how water works and mm -hmm. the impacts. And, yes. And I think I still have on my wall a wonderful fish print that oh, I made right. many years ago. I so. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so the water festival, we bring about, about a thousand third and fourth graders to, mm -hmm. um, Usually it's the Kitsap County Fairgrounds for a day of learning about water. And lots of different educators come and share information with the students. And I've also seen uh, some pretty awesome YouTube videos that will make sure that we put the YouTube address in our closing credits just so that you can check it out as well. But it's pretty cool to actually see it um, yes. if you're not. And actually for Salmon in the Classroom this year, because so many schools are not in session, um, what we're doing this year is we are raising salmon at the Public Works Annex. So we have a tank, our eggs arrived January 11th, the salmon started hatching to Alavin about the 19th of January, mm -hmm. and um, I'm posting videos about twice a week, sometimes a little more often when mm -hmm. they were hatching, it was probably three or four in one week because there was a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then teachers are, uh, are able to access those videos and community members can access those videos as well and watch the development of salmon. So we're almost out of time with our show today, but is there anything else that you want to make sure that our viewers learn about? Well, I think some of these programs that we do, the Salmon in the Classroom and the Water Festival, they have, they're field trips that um, are memorable for students. It really sticks in their minds. Uh, the Salmon in the Classroom program, we have parents that come as chaperones to the field trips and they remember releasing salmon when they were young. So it really helps, I think, to create that connection between people and salmon. That's wonderful. Intergenerational and long lasting. Yes, exactly. Well, awesome. Well, thanks so much for being part of the program today. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for joining me for this episode of Commissioner's Corner. I hope you learned a lot. Make sure that you check out additional resources at our uh, the county website as well as our YouTube channel if you want to see more videos. But hopefully you're taking away something from this that knowing that it's complex when the rain falls from the sky, a lot happens behind the scenes to make sure that we have the best environment around us. So we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.